This is Patrick Perry for Mongo TV, and today we have a special guest, a legend in college football. For those familiar with the game of football, especially in college, this man needs no introduction. For those who aren't, I'd like to introduce one of college's great, Tom Osborne. Well, thank you very much. You're very complimentary. Tom, <laughs> you're welcome, and thank you for being with us today. Mm -hmm. I'd like to start out and ask, Aside from coaching the Huskers for 25 years, winning three national championships, you served under Bob Devaney, first as an offensive assistant and then later as the offensive coordinator. And what I'd like to know, what was your experience like working with Bob Devaney? Well, Bob was, um, was a great guy to work for. He um, had a good sense of humor and uh, good touch with people. You know, the players like to play for him. Uh, sometimes he had a temper, but he never never held a grudge, and uh, he always knew when to mix in a little bit of humor if he was upset. And um, so I would probably correct one thing. Uh, when Bob was a coach, we didn't have any titles, so there wasn't, I was never officially the offensive coordinator. But the last two or three years that I was with him, I did call most of the plays from the press box. I did work with the quarterbacks. And uh, so I guess um, in, in many ways I adopted the role of a, of a coordinator. And we had a guy named Monty Kiffin who later has become fairly well known as a professional coach, defensive coach who ran the defense. So um, he had good people around him, and, but he himself was a great guy. I see you had some experience in the NFL with the San Francisco 49ers and Washington Redskins. And even though it wasn't a long time, how did that experience help you coaching in college football? Well, actually, uh, back up a little bit, I, I went to Hastings College, which is a relatively small school, and um, had chances to go to some major schools, including the University of Nebraska. But I wanted to play both football and basketball, and everybody said, well, you gotta do one or the other at the major college level. So I went to Hastings and, um, and had some success there. But I think one that the NFL experience uh, answered at least one question for me that I would, would have always had, and that was, well, could I have played at a higher level? And um, so uh, I, I learned a lot in those three years, uh, two years with the 40, actually a year and a half with the 49ers and two years with the Redskins. and. Um, and I felt it was a, a good experience. I certainly traveled the country, met a lot of great athletes. And at, at that time, there were only 12 NFL teams. And today there's, I think, 33. And uh, there were only 38 players on a team at that time. And today it's 53. So you can imagine that the pool was, uh, was much smaller. And um, so I, I came into the NFL as a quarterback out of Hastings College. But the, uh, the head coach at the 49ers, a guy named Red Hickey, and Red called me in the first day and he said, well, we only got two, two quarterback spots open and we have John Brody and we have Y.A. Tittle and uh, we're only going to keep two. And if you can beat out one of those guys, we'll go ahead. So I could tell that he was kind of politely telling me I better change spots. So I became a receiver that day and something I had never done before, but uh, made the transition. and. Um, so I hung on for three years and then eventually had a hamstring injury that was bad enough I couldn't play anymore. But that was, a, in a way, a good thing because I came back to the University of Nebraska and went to graduate school and, uh, and I eventually kind of slid into coaching. I didn't plan to be a coach, mm. but as time went on, I um, found that the appeal of athletics just never left me and so I ended up spending most of my life in, in athletics. It's a good thing you did. Well, I... I I hope so. I, I think it worked out well for me. It did. I think it worked out for the whole state. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you were pretty well known, you know, with the eye back. I was wondering, mm -hmm. how did you come up with that or get familiar with it? And why was it so successful at Nebraska? Well, <clears throat> we, uh, when Bob Devaney came here, he ran from a formation, usually an unbalanced line with a full house backfield, which would be a little bit similar to the wishbone today. And uh, uh, Oklahoma had begun to have some success with the I formation. And people kind of caught up with Bob's offense. So he asked me if I would redesign the offense. And uh, 
The one thing about the I formation, if you had a great back, uh, he can go any place on the field. If you're in a full house backfield and you're the left half back, that means basically you're limited to going straight ahead or wide to the right. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a lot of places on the field where you really aren't going to be very effective. And um, so, uh, for instance, if you had a great player like Amon Green or some of the great eye backs we had, we would certainly utilize them more effectively. So uh, we we uh, went to the eye formation and essentially stayed with it uh, through my whole coaching career. Sure. Uh, that was a pretty versatile type of offense, correct? Well, we you know, we did a lot of things. We we ran a lot of different formations, and but we were basically a running team and uh, a lot of emphasis on the option. Sure. Uh, and you see a lot of that today on the zone read, where essentially you're, there's one player that you're not blocking, and the quarterback uh, finesses that guy. Either uh, the, the guy comes and takes the back, and you pull the ball and run it as a quarterback, or if the, if the defensive end hangs out there and he's ready to play the quarterback, you hand it off. And so there's one person that is unblocked, and that's true of option football. There's uh, mm -hmm. one person that you're either going to keep the ball or you're going to pitch it and uh, finesse that guy. So that gives you a little bit of an advantage in terms of having uh, 10 other players who are able to, uh, to, to block uh, their 10 men, mm -hmm. and you're not outnumbered. Yeah. Well, you did quite well. You had a record with at least nine wins a season, 25 bowl appearances, had the I-formation option game. What would you credit as the, let's say, the number one reason Nebraska was that successful? Well, we, I'd say maybe two or three things. Number one, we had uh, excellent staff continuity. Our coaches uh, seemed to like it here. They stayed around. So uh, the average college coach that would be an assistant only stays in one place about three years. So that means that if you have nine assistants, you're uh, replacing one-third of your staff every year. Mm. And um, I would say that we probably re had one assistant coach leave every two or three years. So we had tremendous stability and continuity, which is very helpful. We also had a very strong walk-on program. We were the only major college in the state so we had a lot of players who were fairly gifted, who uh, maybe weren't quite at the level of a true Division I recruit, who would walk on here and develop. And uh, we had a huge number of those players who uh, started for us, and some of them went on to the NFL. Some were All-American players. So uh, that was helpful. And then, and then of course, you've got to have talent. And so uh, I think all those things worked together, along with the loyalty of the Nebraska fans. You know, we've been sold out here every game for 50 years. And uh, I think that was a big recruiting advantage just because when players would come here from California or other places around the country and uh, and see the loyalty of the fans and the, and the fan base, that was always a, a big selling point. So we, we had a lot of things that uh, worked well for us. and But we were always uh, battling population and distance because uh, with a low population base, we had to recruit nationally, and it's always harder to recruit players from both coasts and from Texas and from Florida than it is from people that are close by. Sure. You did a good job with that, though. Well, we, we got our share. Yeah, mm -hmm. he did. Nebraska also frequently, uh, back in the days, would sometimes have, like, what, the nation's number one, nation's number two defense. Used mm -hmm. to have some strong defenses. How did you uh, get that accomplished? Well, um, again, we had some good players, good athletes. We, uh, toward the end of my coaching career, the last six, seven, eight years, we put a lot of emphasis on speed. So we had a lot of guys that were playing linebacker that would, in most systems, would have been defensive backs that could run 10, 500 meters, and that was helpful. And then we had uh, our defensive coordinator for most of that time was a guy named Charlie McBride. Sure and uh, had defensive uh, coaches that were here a long time. And, uh, and that was helpful because sometimes you'd get something thrown at you in a ball game that, you, that was a little bit unexpected. You hadn't practiced on it all week. But you could go back and remember, well, this is what we did three years ago when we saw this. And so that continuity, that institutional knowledge was always very helpful. Sure. Yeah, Charlie was a good one. 
He was. Yeah, yeah. very good. Mm -hmm. Tom, if you don't mind, tell me just briefly a little about your personal values and how you applied them to coaching. Okay. Well, I um, uh, first of all, I'm a, a fairly uh, committed Christian person, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that has always shaped my my value system. So uh, uh, we put a lot of emphasis here on integrity. I think uh, it's easy to say that, but uh, there have been a few books where people have interviewed former players, and one thing that most all of them will mention that Nebraska didn't promise them anything. They just said, well, uh, you come here, we're going to give you a chance to play. Uh, certainly there were no illegal inducements, but on, on top of that there were no promises of playing time. You know, it's so often so easy to tell a player, well, you come here, you'll start as a freshman, or you're not going to have any competition. But they um, uh, they seemed to feel that we were we leveled with them. Mm -hmm. We told them who we had here, who we were recruiting, and uh, never made it appear to be quicker and easier than it was going to be. And so we lost some players, but I think for the most part we lost those guys that were looking for some kind of a quick fix. Sure. And the right ones tended to come. So I think integrity was important. I think loyalty was important. We uh, expected people to uh, not talk behind each other's backs, and that led to pretty good team chemistry. Sure. And um, great work ethic. Uh, we thought our players uh, outworked a lot of teams that we had to play. And so all of those things, I think, were important, as well as a positive environment. We uh, tried to never humiliate or denigrate a player. And uh, as much as we could, we tried to be positive with them. Certainly if they made a mistake, you pointed it out, but you didn't try to humiliate him in the process. So those are some of the things I think that were helpful. Oh, I'm sure. And while coaching the Huskers, what do you consider some of your greatest accomplishments? Now this could be on the mm -hmm. field or off. Well, I, th I think the, um, the relationships are the things that have stayed with me more than anything. Uh, there's hardly a day go by goes by that I don't hear from a former player, uh, either on the phone or by email, or somebody drops by, and uh, so uh, those relationships will continue over time. You know, the the trophies and the rings and the watches uh, they fade, they get lost, they get thrown away. Right. But relationships are are important, and um, I think generally speaking, our players have a very good feeling about this place the way they were treated, the experience they had here, and the fact that uh, I believe 95% of the players who finished their eligibility here have gotten their degree. So um, all those things have worked well. So I guess if there was one thing I'm proud of is how the players were treated mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that they have remained connected and uh, for the most part very loyal to the program. Sure, definitely. Let me ask you, also, through the years, you've won some prestigious awards. Is there mm. anyone in particular that stands out the most, that maybe meant the most to you? Well, <laughs> not particularly. I, I think, um, I remember Bob Devaney was named Coach of the Year, and this was after the, I think, 1971, we beat Alabama in the Orange Bowl, won the national championship. And I know how important that was to Bob. and. Uh, and uh, so I was really pleased to see that for, for his sake. And uh, so it's always nice to be recognized by your peers. Sure. So uh, you know that was something that uh, I was also able to experience. But I never really placed a lot of emphasis on titles and awards and those kind mm -hmm. of things. It had to do more with the process and, and uh, relationships. And uh, I guess as I've gotten older, I've come to realize that the relationships are, are really in the long run, the things that count. Sure. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the intangibles are really mm -hmm. the most important. Mm -hmm. next, next thing I want to ask is still somewhat along those lines, and we'll move on to a few other questions, is uh, in your opinion, you worked with a lot of young guys, you coached them on the field, this pertained to football and strategies, but you also dealt with some of these guys at different levels. Um, had to be somewhat of a mentor and so forth to, to a lot of the guys. Uh, what would you say 
makes a person let's, uh, an athlete, a college athlete, what makes them successful on the field and off? Well, uh, first of all, they have to be pretty disciplined because you're, uh, you're, there are a lot of time constraints. You're, you're going to spend uh, about 20 hours a week either um, uh, lifting weights or practicing, and then you're going to be going to school, which is almost a full-time job, probably 40 hours a week in your schoolwork. And uh, as a result, there isn't a lot of spare time. So whereas many, many students can spend three, four, five hours a day watching television or doing something that would be extracurricular, um, a college athlete can't do that. And of course, the other thing that's uh, very, uh, very obvious is that there's a tremendous amount of public scrutiny of the college athlete. And so um, an inadvertent or an ill-advised tweet, uh, some comment or some indiscretion in terms of uh, showing up in a bar or getting involved in an altercation. If there's 10 people standing on a street corner and one guy throws a rock and hits a car, uh, and invariably the athlete will be picked out out of those uh, 10 people. So you have to be aware of behavior issues. And I guess one thing I might add just kind of as an adjunct is that um, the thing that really struck me over the years was uh, the uh, changes that I was seeing in our culture. Mm -hmm. Started out coaching in 1962. At that point I'd never heard of a gang. Uh, never heard of cocaine, never heard of methamphetamine. Uh, I guess I'd heard of marijuana, but didn't know anybody had ever used it. And then by the end of my coaching career, I was starting to see some gang activity, not so much here in Lincoln, but mm. around the country, certainly, and certainly there was a drug culture. And, uh, and above all, the family instability. Because uh, sure. back in the early 60s, uh, you would occasionally run across a uh, a uh, young man from a single parent family, but usually it was because one parent or the other was deceased. But uh, today, 50% of our young people grow up without both biological parents. And um, so that lack of stability in their home life uh, meant that you spent progressively more and more time with uh, off the field issues, with personal issues. Mm -hmm. And it uh, didn't mean these were not good people, they were good kids, they were well intentioned but they uh, probably weren't as directed as kids who had uh, been here back in the early 60s. Sure. I know it's a job. Mm -hmm. You did well with it. Well, hope so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna change directions just a little bit. Uh, looking back at your teams, what, is there a particular team you would think is, was the most outstanding? And it could be for mm -hmm. different reasons. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose our 1995 team was the most talented team. Um, we, uh, we were undefeated that year, and the closest anybody came to us was, uh, I think, 14 points. So, uh, and that's pretty unusual to be able to go through without at least having a close call or getting beat. And uh, uh, I would say maybe the most memorable and uh, maybe the most outstanding team in terms of the way they conducted themselves was a the 1994 team. Mm. And uh, that team was also undefeated. It was not as talented as the 95 team. But we uh, lost Tommy Frazier, our starting quarterback, for almost the whole season. We lost Mike Mentor, our best defensive back for the season. And uh, yet it didn't seem to make any difference what happened, who was hurt, or what went on. Uh, uh, they seemed to have some, such tremendous resolve, so much, so much uh, team chemistry. Uh, mutual caring about each other that uh, if one segment of the team was weakened the other segment picked it up and picked uh, it up. so probably from a, a team aspect and a team chemistry uh, aspect that was probably the most memorable team. Um, with Nebraska moving into the Big Ten now mm -hmm. how do you think they'll perform in the long run? Well I think we'll do very well the um, one thing that is better, you know, compared to the Big 12, in the Big 12 we had a north-south league. So a lot of our sports, uh, not so much football, but golf, tennis, uh, baseball, softball, the southern schools had quite an advantage in terms of weather. And 
uh, obviously if you're somebody who has aspirations beyond college and you play one of those sports you're apt to it's much easier to recruit if you're from Texas or Baylor or A&M mm -hmm. or even Oklahoma than a school like Nebraska where you're going to get a fair amount of snowfall. So we now have um, more of a level playing field in terms of weather. Everybody's got the same problems. The only thing that <coughs> will be a major obstacle to us is population density. Mm. Ohio, obviously, uh, or Ohio State is, uh, they have a lot of a lot more people, therefore they have a lot more players, Michigan. Um, uh, so most of the schools, most of the states are more populated than Nebraska. Sure. So we have to have great facilities, we have to have highly motivated coaches, we have to do everything uh, uh, at a pretty high level in order to be competitive. But I think we can be very competitive here. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. I like hearing that. Uh, since retiring from coaching, do you ever miss it? Uh, first couple years were really hard. I um, I did miss it, and I did have a chance to uh, go to Michigan State, and was very tempted, and uh, was thinking about it. Mm. And uh, my grandson called me. I think he was five years old at the at the time, and he was crying and said he'd heard that I might be leaving, and he didn't want that to happen. He said that'd be a big mistake, so uh, I just couldn't tell him I was going to be leaving. And also, you know, having been here at Nebraska for 36 years, it would have been really strange for me to go coach some some uh, team that was dressed in green. Yeah. So I, I just couldn't do it. So, um, but as time has gone on, I've gotten more, a little bit more uh, philosophical, a little bit more detached, and uh, so it's not as hard. It's still sometimes difficult to go watch a game and realize that you have no control. You know, mm -hmm. you're. you're you're just sitting there like every other fan, and there's nothing that you can do to make a decision that might might change things. But overall, it's it's been good. And actually, you answered the second part of my question. Okay. I was going to ask you how you feel during game day, but mm -hmm. it sounds like you've touched on part of that already. Well, yeah, I probably I probably a little different than most fans. Uh, maybe a little bit more analytical, uh, a little more understanding of. The team doesn't win because I know that uh, all all that goes into it, and and it is an emotional game. It's a very mm -hmm. difficult game, but um, still, uh, I, I am a fan and I do watch every game. Oh, neat. Well, let me say I believe that Husker fans in general, including myself, being from Nebraska, following the program for so many years, really do just appreciate what you've done for the university, the team. Uh, the loyalty the fans have felt. You've given them something to kind of identify with and hold on to. As time goes on and you think of the average Husker fan, how do you want to be remembered, for example, people like myself, when we talk about you and we tell our grandkids, how would you like to be remembered by the Husker fans? Well, I, I, I guess I would hope that they would uh feel that I, I did the best I could for the uh, school, athletic department, and the state. Um, it's kind of strange here in Nebraska, but uh, Nebraska athletics and Nebraska football seems to be a very strong unifying element. And so whether you're in Scotts Bluff, clear in the western part of the state, or Omaha or Lincoln, uh, one common topic that most people seem to have in common is uh, is Nebraska athletics, particularly Nebraska football. And uh, so the reason I came back here as athletic director five years ago was that um, there were some divisions, mm -hmm. uh, things probably weren't as good as they could have been. And uh, I thought, well, if I could if I could help uh, restore a certain sense of unity, that that would be a good thing, be good for the state. Sure. And, uh, so uh, Nebraska is unique in that we have only the one major university in the state, whereas most places have at least two or three. And um, it does seem that uh, people are very, very loyal and almost fanatical about Nebraska athletics. And uh, sometimes that's a little uncomfortable because there's a lot, of, a lot of scrutiny and a lot of heat. But on the other hand, it certainly beats apathy. 
and we don't have that here. No. <laughs> and uh, and those 50 years of sellouts is a, is a pretty much of a testimony to the fact that we have uh, tremendously dedicated fans. So we have great fans. They're knowledgeable. Uh, they treat opponents with respect. And uh, so I've been very proud of our fan base over the years and mm -hmm. the way they've uh, reacted. Lastly, mm -hmm. is there anything you'd like to add today? No, not really. I'm, I'm, uh, it's been nice to have a chance to, to visit with you. Likewise. And uh, uh, I'm glad to find that there's a Nebraska fan down in Kansas City. <laughs> Actually, I hear there's quite a few. Well, there are quite a few. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tom, I do want to thank you for taking the time to be with mm -hmm. us today. And like I said, Husker fans definitely appreciate everything you've done. And uh, with your retirement coming up, we want to wish you a very fulfilled retirement. And uh, hopefully some your better days of fishing are still ahead. Well, I have a little bit more time, and I do have a lot of plans. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tom, thank you so much. Yeah, nice to see you. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Thank you.